Welcome to this webinar on climate change, focusing on how data is evolving to understand risk and meet the climate change challenge. I'm Claire Elliott and today I'm joined by David Kempster, who is the Marketing Director at Groundshare. He has nearly 20 years experience in developing environmental risk in geospatial data products, strategy and communications. I'll also be joined by Stephen Sykes, who is an honorary member and former chair of the UK Environmental Law Association. He also co-founded the City of London's Environmental Insurance Market and is a solicitor in the real estate team at Capital Law. Together, they will be bringing you an up-to-date on all matters relating to climate risk. So please, let's get started. What is risk? Well, thanks, Claire. You know, at the heart uh, of our job as lawyers is the task of de-risking property transactions and matters of that sort for our, for our clients. So let's just reflect a little bit on what risk is. Uh, at its simplest, it's the likelihood that an adverse event will occur. So in an environment climate context, context that might be flooding, different types of flooding, coastal, riverine flooding, groundwater flooding, or, or all of them. Or it could be a subsidence uh, event, or it could be the service of a statutory notice because the site's contaminated and a regulator wants to get involved and requires you to clean the site up to make it safe. So risk is how likely is something like that, something adverse, going to happen. And to actually manage risk, if we're talking to any professional risk managers, they say the critical thing is to measure it. Just to give it a general context that there's a risk there without subjectifying, qualifying it without ideally putting numbers on it, it makes it very difficult to do anything sensible about it. But where the risk becomes material, where it becomes unacceptable to a client, there's a need to intervene. And we as lawyers may have a number of tools at our disposal, including the client may withdraw from the transaction where a risk which they've measured, quantified through one means or another, where it seems to be unacceptable to them. And in making that assessment, it isn't finger in the air, we need data for those sort of assessments. And in the environmental world, we need that data to be based on sound science, underpinning science, be it about groundwater, be it about flooding, contamination, whatever the, the problem might be. And that data, there's no point communicating it in, in hypothetical terms, in over technical terms, it needs to be uh, put in layman's terms for use by lawyers and ultimately for use by our clients. So risk essentially is that process of quantifying risk, determining whether it's acceptable or unacceptable. If it's unacceptable, can we de-risk it? Can we make it acceptable for our clients? And can we, above all, help them understand the risks that they're facing and uh, yeah, get to a point where they're comfortable to proceed with the transaction with the matter in hand? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head, put it in layman's terms because they're not scientists, you know, they're not the experts in, in this field. So what would you say are the key moments of change to inform property transaction? Well, I've been working in and around environmental law and environmental data and insurance for such a long time that I can cast my mind back to the turn of the century um, when part 2A of the Environmental Protection Act was coming in, this revolutionary uh, statute to remediate our legacy of industrial land, industrial contaminated land, which is, which is extensive. It's just quite interesting to see how the data, the environmental data industry responded to that statute because it responded by making relatively low cost, easy to understand, underpin all the things I've talked about before, sound science, lay, put, putting the information across in layman's terms. It produced reports that would facilitate those, those sorts of transactions. That's how it re responded. So there was an opportunity, there was a market driver, if you like, and the market responded with simple ranking system, recommendations, some traffic light systems, but ways of helping the lawyer understand that these risks are material and could be unacceptable to a client and therefore need uh, to be dealt with. So, and that happened relatively quickly. Uh, within a short period of time, we had the warning card, it came to practice note in 2014. Um, and that's what drives a lot of the, the industry now for contaminated land and other environmental data. So what would you say the main physical climate risks are on land and property? Well, this changing climate that we are already experiencing um, derives from increasing global temperatures. 
Now, the Paris uh, Agreement from 2015, which some may have heard of, was uh, an attempt to try and cap the global increase at 1.5 degrees. We're already at 1, 1.1, so we're already a long way there. And the Met Office quite recently was saying, actually, we may, we may exceed 1.5 degrees in, in some years, at some, some points, by 2027. So well, that, that seems, a, it seems remote, kind of doesn't seem a way off, but it seems, okay, how does that relate to the, U, to the UK? For the UK, our, our climate's changing as the wetter times of year are becoming even wetter. And, and that's been happening since at least 1990, with maybe a 15% increase in precipitation in some parts of the UK. And the drier periods are going to become drier, so we're going to get more extreme heat incidents. This is what the Met Office is, is telling us is already happening and it's going, only going to intensify. So you think, OK, climate change, wet or wet, dry, dry, but what does it actually mean? What it means for UK land and buildings is greater coastal erosion, greater subsidence, uh, greater flooding and other geo impacts from extreme weather events. So property, land and property that's not at risk from any of these factors right now will be at risk in the years, certainly in the decades that are to come. And they'll have all kinds of repercussions for the new design of buildings, new sustainable drainage, to making those uh, new buildings more resilient to tackle uh, climate change, uh, making the buildings capable of being cooled as well as, 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 as warmed to mitigate um, the use of uh, carbon um, and oil and gas. All kinds of implications will arise from the fact that the planet's warming up too quickly. Okay. So the scale of forward climate impacts, where are we at with that? Well, I put some numbers together here because it kind of concentrates the mind and it makes us understand what the main environmental, geo-environmental risks are right now and the future that, that uh, unfortunately, but we have to face it, we're heading into. So if you take the flood risk number at the top there, this is an EA number, uh, actually SEPA uh, and NIEA and NRW in Wales, it's a UK wide number, 5.62 million right now, but roll forward, what, just under 30 years and we're at 6 million. So that's another 400,000 properties are going to be at risk. Mm -hmm. It's only a 6% increase, but it makes it, it means close to one in four property transactions are going to involve properties that have a one in a hundred year uh, event chance of, of, of flood risk. So it's going to become a very commonplace task for lawyers to be able to advise on these issues and to know the way around that uh, flood risk. Subsidence, um, 1.62 million now. This is an astonishing uh, hike. So essentially it's from uh, the, the drier, dry weather will uh, will give rise to uh, the shrinking of clay, particularly in the southeast and in London. Some of the numbers are fairly ph phenomenal, actually, how much uh, substance is going to be impacting uh, that part of the UK. So we've got a 250% increase um, over yeah, a 50-year period from subsidence. And it doesn't become as prominent quite as flood risk, but it's closing the gap. And it's something that real estate lawyers will encounter with greater frequency going forward than they do at the moment. And I put the numbers up, coastal erosion, uh, 12,000 around the UK, we've got a massive coastline going up to 80,000. So yeah, six-fold increase for 80,000 as opposed to 6 million flooding and 4 million of subsidence. And in then even again, to try and drive this point home, what does that mean? It means as lawyers, we have to be mindful that our clients in the future, maybe even right now, could be looking at buying land and buildings but the blind unless they acquire good quality climate data where that where that land or building might may fall into the sea may collapse may have substance problems all kinds of repercussions um, and that will impact value and actually cause a client a lot of stress and it could lead to a pi claim against the law firm if they've not flagged this up through their duty of care to warn their clients that these risks are out there yeah, some staggering uh, increases there, aren't they? So what do lawyers want from climate data reports? Okay, so um, back in March, we did a roundtable with some senior real estate lawyers, and uh, primarily we were focusing on the impacts to commercial real estate. Uh, but there were some very key findings that came out around how climate data could and should be included alongside um, the, almost the classic suite of environmental data that they're very familiar with. And the uh, one overriding theme that came out from the roundtable was that lawyers do want to keep these things extremely simple. 
Um, the ranking system, I think, is still really important. You know, they're used to traffic lights. They're used to understanding where something doesn't have a risk but could have a risk that they need to look at or could have a, a medium risk that they, they need to look at that may have some impact to the client in the future on the, the asset security. Um, and the, the third and fundamental thing as well is that if the site does display a high risk, what does that actually mean in terms of the impact to the client and what can be done, if anything, to lower the risk? It might be in the future that there is some form of quantification that can be provided that enables a clear understanding to the lawyer um, <clears throat> and therefore their client uh, in terms of if they took this asset on, um, what could be the financial cost of doing that? Um, and how does that translate in the negotiation? That can be fairly significant figures in a commercial transaction, but can also be significant in terms of things like making a property more flood resilient, for example, if you're buying a residential property. Um, and, and that's the sort of uh, context of, of guidance that I think becomes important down the line uh, as these things become more significant in the transaction, especially where lenders are looking at the, their degree of exposure in terms of potential impact on value as well. So, so that is significant. Um, in terms of how environmental data providers such as ourselves are responding to and understanding climate change risk, um, really we're looking at site-specific climate data and, and looking at how its physical risk is going to be impacted on specific sites and buildings. So that can be the land and the quality of the land itself and how that's impacted, or, or it could be indeed the, the individual buildings and assets related to it. Um, there are different warming scenarios that are out there. As Stephen said earlier in this, this webinar, um, you know, 1.5 is kind of where we're headed at the moment. And if we do all that we've said that we were going to do it could if we're lucky stay at 1.5 realistically over the kind of term that we're talking about here you know 30 50 years it's likely to exceed that because it takes a long while for this ship to turn but i do think that you know there are there are some data um reports out there that are pointing to a four degree change uh, which is potentially overly pessimistic you know i've seen you know, cartoons being drawn about Armageddon in response to that kind of um, uh, scenario. I, I don't think we're there um, or, or likely to get there. Um, and, you know, we've got to be realistic and pragmatic about what we report on. It's got to take an average, potentially, of, of things down the line. Um, but for, for me, the modelling is really important and what, what the basis of the modelling is going to be built on. But also that the information that's contained in these reports needs to be super clear and simple um, and for me, the two big things for lawyers are that it needs to be compliance ready. You know, we've talked in previous webinars about what the law society and the lenders are looking to do with regard to compliance that they want conveyances to follow uh, and the best uh, practice in terms of client care. So providing data that fulfills that brief in terms of it being compliance ready is really important and it enables um, that guidance to be followed. And crucially, that it's friction free. And then by that, I mean that it provides information, you know, contained within um, the reports that they're familiar with, that they're not having to, you know, engineer processes or change things in a different way. Um, and that things are provided as part of the standard tools and, and processes that they do already without having to think about new things, new products, new services and so on. So I think that element is, is really important as well, because these are busy people and to accommodate climate change amongst everything else that they're having to investigate it's really important that these things are made as simple and as easy to use as possible so that's fundamental um, and crucially the final point really is that advice that's contained and signposted in these reports really does need uh, to be able to be lifted and shifted and it enables them to signpost it as part of their duty of care and any future guidance yeah, no. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Stephen, and to David. Um, I hope you found that insightful. And we are all on hand if you've got any further questions or need any support from us. Thank you again.